Okay, everybody, we're going to get started again. I'm going to make sure everybody's muted right now so I can mute everybody. And then um, throughout the course of this presentation, try not to ask questions during the presentation by unmuting yourself because we're going to take questions at the very end. Um, we're going to take questions at the end, and it's probably going to be about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minute presentation just on different DOT stuff. So now what's our goal with this meeting? Our goal is to have you guys join this meeting, learn as much as possible, leave the meeting having learned something. So that's the number one goal. You know, some people might learn more than others or less than others, but, you know, if we can leave this meeting, help improve our company as a whole, that's the whole goal of what we're doing. So a little idea here about the speaker. Uh, my name is John Seidel. I work at Reliance Partners. I'm a DOT consultant. I used to be a state patrol inspector for about 12 years. So if you're a driver on the call, I can relate directly. I used to pull drivers over at, at scales and at roadside and do full level one, two, three, four, five inspections. Then I left the state patrol and became an investigator with the federal government. So I knocked on company doors and did full reviews of their safety. I was also a hazmat agent with the FAA. And if I look like this, I apologize. I'm not on video, but I presented for Heavy Duty Truck Magazine, and this is the picture that they showed. So kind of funny. All right, so before we start talking about revenue, expenses, CSA scores, our insurance, our freight, getting the job done, safety is what this is about. We want to make sure that all the people that are dear to us come home. So this guy right here, he was a truck driver. He was in California. He did not go to work one day intending on hurting anyone, but think of his job. He's a truck driver. How many jobs in America do you have someone's life in the palm of your hand? And I'll tell you, one's a truck driver. Another one might be a pilot, a boat captain, a train engineer. So I covered transportation, um, police officer, firefighter, food preparer, doctor, um, pharmacist, you know, military. So, so you see how hard this is? It's hard to come up with jobs where you have someone's life in the palm of your hand. We're talking maybe a dozen, 15 jobs, and truck driver is one of them. He had no intention on hurting anyone. Now, you tell me of those people, if you don't do your job right, how many go to jail? And I can say he was charged with manslaughter in 2007 because three people got killed, five-year-old Kyle, four-year-old Emma, and two-year-old Katie. When I was an investigator with the feds is when I saw this article, I immediately said, come downstairs because this girl right here is Katie. And they all lost their lives because he made a mistake one day. He didn't intend to hurt anyone and neither does any truck driver intend to hurt anybody. So then I heard this, seen this article and I said, come downstairs. And immediately these three kids came downstairs. This is my daughter, Katie. So now in 2007, two-year-old Katie, she'd be 14 today. I'm not kidding here. My Katie is 14 today, so this is what drives me. And if it doesn't drive you, you got family, you got friends, everyone on this call has their own Katie. So if you don't do it for my Katie, do it for your own Katie or all the Katies out there. So before we get in trying to educate everybody on how to improve revenue and reduce expenses and make more money and, and all these PC issues and yard moves, we have to remember that this is about safety. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about safety culture. We're gonna use a model that the government uses when they come knock on our door to try to identify and show people how we could improve our safety. Now, are we perfect? Nobody's perfect. We have room for improvement. That's why we're doing this meeting because you'll see how I incorporate this into the safety culture. CSA, what does CSA mean to you? I'll tell you, CSA was invented by the federal government to select trucking companies to get their door knocked on. That's the whole purpose of CSA is to see which companies need a visit from the feds. Now, who else has used it? Insurance companies, freight brokers, shippers, receivers, attorneys. They've all used CSA. Why? To get more money in a lot of cases. We'll explain that. So now once we talk about CSA and where we are and how the system works, and we're going to talk about hours of service, including the ELD mandate. What's our plan? What's on the horizon? And then the last thing we're going to talk about is vehicle maintenance on unsafe driving. Again, about hour and 15 minutes of information we're gonna be going through. So this is called the safety management cycle. When the feds come knock on our door because they visit us. Now, what causes a visit? 
high CSA scores. What else? A complaint. What else? High profile accident, or if we hire drivers that aren't the most acceptable drivers, they may do what's called a driver strike force and check us out, right? So now what do they want us to do? They want us to use this cycle to improve. We're going to use an example of personal conveyance. Do we and or should we have a policy on personal conveyance? Yes. So the government is promoting us to have a policy on personal conveyance. What is the role of management to develop one and enforce it? What's the role of the driver to use it properly? What's the role of law enforcement to make sure that we are, or that they are enforcing it to make sure that they gain compliance? So everybody has a role. Qualification and hiring. We hire good drivers. I'm gonna show you as an example with National Heavy Haul, when we go through the CSA scores, that proof is in the pudding that we have good quality drivers within our organization. So if we hire the right people and have the right policies and everybody understands their role, we're good. Now, how do they do that? We have to train and communicate. We have to do these kind of things to improve our operation. This meeting that we're in right now is one step in training and communication on that policy amongst other things. Now, what do we do? We have to monitor and track it. We can be proactive and use our team that checks our logs to look at personal conveyance, make sure we use it right. And then if we find out drivers are using it right, we should credit them. We should say, hey, great job. Give them a pat on the back. If they're using it wrong, we should take some kind of action. Does that mean discipline? Maybe not. Maybe the action is to revisit our procedure or hire more people or more qualified people or train and communicate on that procedure so then when you monitor it later, there's improvement. It always doesn't have to be a stick. So this is what the government wants us to use to improve our operation. So now let's talk trucking. I'm sitting back in my chair. I'm in Wisconsin. It's actually a nice day, but what's the number one goal of trucking or any business? We want to make as much money as possible. How do you do that in trucking? Your wheels have to spin around in circles. The more our wheels spin around in circles, the more money we make. But we want to do it safely and efficiently. If we use the hours of service, for example, to our advantage by utilizing PC properly, yard move properly, split sleeper, 100 air mile radius exemption, adverse driving condition exemption, 16 hour work days, these are all things that can help improve the efficiencies of our operation. So number one, let's increase our revenue. But now on the flip side, we wanna reduce expenses. Name me the expenses. Now, you can't name them because it's a webinar, but I want your mind thinking. Name me expenses that cost money to run a trucking company. All right, fuel. Fuel costs a lot of money. Insurance. Insurance costs a lot of money, and your minds are going. Um, maintenance. Vehicle maintenance costs a lot of money. And driver payroll. Now, an effective business wants one of those four expenses to go up. I know some people on the call, you're like, they don't want any expenses to go up. It's a business. Not true in trucking. We want payroll to go up. And in the eyes of owner operators, that's 1099s. We want to pay them as much money as possible. But how do we do that as a trucking company? We can increase our revenues to get more profits to pay people. Well, that's one way, which we already said. The other way is to reduce expenses. So let's reduce the other three expenses. And I tell you, just as an idea, get your minds running. Think about fuel fuel. Who's ever almost run out of gas in their car picking their wife up from work or whatever? I did it about, I don't know, a month ago. I went to go pick my wife up. I was on E. She wasn't out yet. I turned the car off. It was hot, so I opened the door. So I was doing things to save on fuel because I was afraid of running out, right? So now, can we drive our trucks like we're always about to run out of fuel? Yeah. Well, who pays for the fuel? You owner operators do. This is your expense too, along with ours. So if you can save fuel, you save on that expense. Now, how do you save fuel? Drive less aggressively. Don't run up to traffic lights. Don't tailgate people. Don't accelerate unnecessarily. Don't make crazy lane changes and slam on brakes and accelerate. So if we drive less aggressively, we're going to save fuel. And by default, we're going to crash less. And we're also going to have less unsafe driving violations for speeding, falling too close, et cetera. So if we can reduce our fuel, we can reduce our crashes, we can reduce our unsafe driving. And I'll tell you, driving less aggressively saves on maintenance too. It's less wear and tear. 
So if we can make more money and reduce our costs, then there's one cost that we can increase and that's the drivers. So now how do we go about doing that? We have to work as a team. Everybody has to play their role. And my role today is to try to educate you on this. Now, CSA, I told you that the government, um, I told you that the government looks at this to decide who to go visit. And I told you that other people look at it too, like insurance and, um, you know, insurance companies look at it and so does litigators and so does our customers. So if our customers are looking at this, they're not giving us as good a freight, which means our revenue is lower. If insurance is looking at it, it's an excuse to charge us more money, which means then we lose on that expense. Um, if litigators look at it, now that's a whole nother expense of paying a lawsuit. So there's this system right here called CAB. CAB is the system underwriters use. So these are our companies. I'm going to click on National Heavy Haul for a minute. Now, in our history tab, you can drop down and you can see that our ISS scores over the course of the last two or three years for National Heavy Haul have been fantastic. Red light is stop this truck for an inspection. Yellow light is let them go. Anything lower than yellow is a green light. Don't even think of stopping them. From 2016 all the way till May of this year, we've basically been under this threshold, right? Um, so now when I scroll down a little further into each of our CSA basics that we're gonna talk about, I can see in here quarterly. These are our quarterly scores. So over the course of the last two and a half years, our unsafe driving has went well below the alert threshold, which is this red line. This tells me that we have quality guy drivers within this organization. Now, our hours of service, I'm going to get into a little more depth. We've always been below the threshold until one month, just this last month, we peaked over this threshold. So we have quality drivers that drive safely. We're staying under the alert threshold with hours of service. Now, is there room for improvement here? Of course there is but we're not saying we're worst in class. Now, vehicle maintenance, this is the alert, this red line. We have steadily been under the alert for the last two, three years. Now, you see our crashes have gone up, even though our unsafe driving, as I go up here, is at the lowest point it's been in three years. For whatever reason, we show more crashes. The illusion here is these crashes are not just crashes that are our fault the government decides to put all crashes that we're involved in that meet a DOT recordable crash into the system. That means if there was a fatality, injury treated from the scene, or physical damage requiring a tow, they put them in here. And I'll tell you, hypothetically, we went through our crashes for National Heavy Haul, and there's approximately three of them. There is no question that these crashes were not our fault. We have a total of 12 crashes with them. So what this shows you is historically we've been great. We've had a couple spikes recently in hours of service and crash, which again, the crashes are not our fault. To go into this a little bit more in depth, I can click on these two screens and this brings me into this main area. Now, right now there are seven basics that the government breaks violations down into. So all roadsides go into these seven categories. Unsafe driving is like seatbelt, falling too close, speeding, using your cell phone. Crashes is how many of those crashes did we have? And in this case, we've had 12. Again, not all of our fault. Hours of service. We've had 273 inspections, and only 19 of them had a hours of service violation. But that puts us into a red status for the first time in years for National Heavy Haul. Our vehicle maintenance is below the threshold. This is another thing to show you how well our drivers are. Driver fitness is CDLs and medical cards. Controlled substance is drinking and being on drugs. Unsafe driving is how we physically operate. I'll tell you right now, these numbers need to be low. And we're at zero, zero, and 7%. The lower, the better. That tells me we have some of the best drivers in these categories. 78% is what's called an alert, and so is 66%. What that says is of the companies the size of National Heavy Haul, 78% of them have less crashes than we do. And 66% of them have less hours of service violations than we have, right? So can we absolutely improve in these three areas, specifically hours of service and potentially even crash? 
Yes. So that is our goal, right? So now I take these categories and break them down a little further. I can go into inspections. I'm going to click on hours of service. These are all of our hours of service inspections, all 19 of them over the course of the last two years. So if I say this again, how long do violations sit in our CSA score? They sit in our CSA score for two years. So we've had 19 in two years. That's a little less than one a month with a company of this size with over 200 inspections. In reality, I don't find that too bad, but we have more points than everybody else in that category other than, you know, we have more points than 66% of the people, my fault. All right, so now on 5-5 of 219, which was just, I don't know, a month ago, we got a driver with a false log and driving over the limit. And that was our um, seven points for each one. So we didn't have a 30 minute break and we had false logs according to the inspector, seven points for each one. So that's a total of 14 points. Then they multiply it by three, giving us total of 42 points. We don't want points. So 66% of the companies in this category have less points than we do. Had we not had this violation, we would have never accrued 42 points. So let's look at that violation. It says driver claim PC, which advanced his trip. Well, we're going to discuss in a little bit. I don't know the details of this, but can you advance your trip? You actually can advance your trip if you just load it and unload it and you're going to the closest location. Just because it's in the direction of where your trip is doesn't mean you can't advance your trip. You just can only go to the nearest place after loading and unloading. So you see this violation was seven points. Now they don't repeat it. It was seven for each one. So every false log that you see here, one, two, three of them, that was seven points. Beyond the 30 minute limit, it says driving beyond the 30 minute limit, no break using PC during break. You can use PC during your break as long as you qualify. Now later in this presentation, I'm gonna explain clearly when you can and can't use PC. Let's pretend for a minute that this driver was using it properly and the officer didn't understand. We can do what's called a data queue. Now we're gonna do the research on this violation to see if that's the case. If it's not the case, we'll just educate our drivers. Now, you guys see there's a ticket here. If we go to court on this ticket and get this ticket dismissed, we can do what's called a data queue and remove it. So even if we can't challenge it based on the facts, we can go to court and get this violation removed just by having it dismissed or reduced in court. So we have a couple options here to basically get these violations off our system. Now, we don't want to do a data queue. We'd rather have our drivers educated to explain it to driver, uh, the inspector or even educate the inspectors, but it's not our job, quite frankly. So what we want to do is I can hit this little button here. When I hit this button here, I just remove this violation. So A, pretend it never happened. B, pretend we explained it to the officer and we were right. C, we do data queues and get it removed. If we do that, our score right now would not be 66%. I recalculate it and it would be 58% and no longer red and not in the alert status. So this one inspection added eight percentage points, increased our score 15% off one inspection when we have all these inspections over the course of time. So you guys can see how flawed this system can be. Just a few errors can kill our score, right? Are we unsafe because we potentially didn't even make a mistake? It was the officer not understanding? Sure, but if it was our mistake, let's learn from it. So now you see our crashes. We went through our crashes. I can do this little drop down here and I can click on crashes, to show you that we've had 12 crashes in the last um, two years for these, for these um, violations. So now if we just randomly take three of them, because I told you three of them weren't our fault, and remove them and calculate our scores, will we be in the alert in this category? We won't, we would have been 58% there too. So 20 percentage points for three crashes, that's about seven percentage points per crash. I'm not saying this system is great in that it makes the most sense in the world, but it's what we got. So um, one more thing I wanted to point out that I kind of skipped over that, it, amazingly important, right, is hours of service. I told you we had 19 total inspections. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this time weight category. It says time weight three, 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 three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of them have time weight three. That means in the last six months, 
um, we've had hours of service violations six times. That's what the time wait three is. If it occurs in the last six months, they multiply it by three. So let's scroll down a little further. How many two points do we have? One, two, three. So the six months before that, we only had three logbook violations in six months. So in the last six months, we had six. The three months before that, we only had three. So we've had twice as many in the last six months than we did before. And the ones that recently are multiplied by more. Now we scroll down to these one point multipliers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in the entire 12 to 24 month period from today, we had 10. The next six months, we did really well and we only had three. Then we went back to six. So if we could repeat what we did, not the last six months, but the six months before that, we would go a year with nine of them, or about 12 of them, instead of having 20 or 23. Now you might think, man, this is a lot of math. What's the point of this? Why is it so complicated? Well, here's what I'll tell you. How much money do you get when you pass go in Monopoly? Everybody's like 200 bucks. What are the most expensive properties? Park Place and Boardwalk? Um, can you collect rent when you're in jail? No. Well, how do you know the rules of this Monopoly game when you haven't played it probably in 20 years? And I'll tell you, Monopoly is fake money. This game called CSA is real money, and we need to have the rules of the game. So how long do violations stay? Two years. Are they multiplied? Yes. Times three, times two, times one. Can we challenge them? Yes. It's called a data queue. If you get tickets and you get those tickets dismissed or reduced, can we challenge them and get those points dismissed or reduced? Yes. Every time we do prevention and management through data queue, we're affecting our scores. And I just showed you through this demonstration how much that can help us. So that's kind of CSA in a nutshell. Um, so now we're going to move on to some more data, right? This is the website for data queues. You can log in here and challenge tickets. If they're dismissed, we get rid of them. If they're reduced to a lesser charge, the point value goes down. Or we can challenge something on merit. Here's an example of another company I had in Minnesota. The driver got pulled over for load securing because they said this load bar was illegally secured. Well, it's a load bar. It's designed to be extended. Now, I'll tell you, it is not a good idea to put a load bar in between two sleeper berth flanges because it could loosen up the brackets and fall out. So I'm not saying it's a good idea, but I'm telling you, it's not a violation. Then they wrote us up for these air hoses chafing. That's the second one. Well, we brought up operational policy 15, which says that air hoses chafing are no longer a violation in you unless you meet certain criteria. So we argued the load securement, the chafing hose. This last one was relay valves. 2018 truck, 2017 trailer. Upon brake application, brakes air leaking at relay valves. Well, relay valves are designed to release air to equalize pressure within the system. The inspector didn't understand this. So we data queued it and got all of them removed. Now this operational policy 15 is interesting. It says in here that you are no longer having chafing air hoses unless there's a reduction in the hose diameter. So even if two hoses are touching and you separate them and look and there's no flat spot and you're not to the fabric, it is no longer a violation for chafing. Then it says it is not a violation if they slightly rub against each other. But now they say a hose that is found to have a reduction but it's no longer chafing, meaning it was touching, you did a pre-trip, you separated it, saw a flat spot, not to the core, and separated it so it's no longer touching, then it's not a violation. It's only a violation when you are through the outer reinforcement ply. Now I'm gonna tell you, inspectors, they probably don't know this. But we are using the safety management cycle and doing training and communication. So now you know that simply having hoses touching are no longer chafing. We use this policy to fight the data queue to get that violation removed for that other company. But we can't do it without you. If you go back here, I need you to take pictures. When we crash our truck, you take pictures. When you're at a scale, take pictures. Now, some officers will be like, what are you taking pictures for? To get away from that and not have it be confrontational, simply tell them it's a company policy. A company policy is what you tell them, that every violation on the inspection, you have to take photos, and we use that for training purposes. Then it gets you and out. Blame it on someone else. Heck, it's Melissa's fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, so now, 
what is this green book? This green book is what are the regulations? What do we need to follow? What did we do wrong? Example, a steer tire, four 30 seconds inch tread in any major tread groove is the minimum tread depth on a steer tire. Where does it say that? 393.75 of this green book. Now, when is that steer tire out of service? It's out of service on a steer when you're less than 230 seconds in two adjacent tread groups. So just because you're in violation doesn't mean you're out of service. This yellow book outlines when a driver or truck is placed out of service or not. So should we have both these books at our disposal? Yes. Where do you get them? On the right is some examples on how to get those. So um, another example with tires, which is interesting, is a flat tire is when on the sidewall, you're less than 50% of the air pressure marked on the sidewall. So if on the sidewall it says maximum pressure 110, anything less than 55, the tire's flat. It's not underinflated, it's flat. So that would be eight points for a bad tire, two extra points because it is below 50%, meaning it's flat and out of service. Eight plus two is 10, 10 times three is 30, six months later, 20, six months later, 10, a year after that, it disappears. So you see how long one bad tire can hurt our scores. So now, that's, via, um, th that's like um, CSA and the data queue in a nutshell. Now we're going to talk about hours of service. A big piece here is let's be compliant, but let's use these hours of service to our advantage to increase revenue. We can also use it to improve driver recruiting and retention. If company A is very flexible and proactive in allowing drivers to use these exemptions as long as they use them properly, and company B is like, no, no personal conveyance, no yard moves, no nothing, just drive your 10, 11 hours and take your 10 hours off, who are you going to want to work for? You're going to want to work for the company that is trying to be more flexible. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to explain these hours of service to add some flexibility. So the 11-hour rule and the 14-hour rule. Hypothetically, you start at 6 a.m. At 8 p.m., I'm going to focus on a word here. At 8 p.m., you cannot drive anymore. I'm going to say it again. You start at 6 a.m., 14 hours later is 8 p.m. At 8 p.m., you cannot drive anymore. But let's say you get to your terminal at 8 p.m. and you want to do your pre-trip. You can do your pre-trip to 14 and a half hours. As long as you did not drive on a highway after the 14th hour. Now let's talk shipper. You start at 6 a.m. At 8 p.m. you get to a shipper and they say, pay, go low, unload over there. You can actually push yard move, which is on duty, not driving. Remember this, the duty status yard move is on duty, not driving. So if you start at 6 a.m. At 8 p.m. you push yard move at the shipper. Then you drive over there under yard move and work until, say, 16 hours. Did you drive on a highway after the 14th hour? You did not. You can work past the 14. Now, mind you, it eats into your 10 hours. It can hurt your 70-hour rule. You can't start your restart or your 10-hour break, but it still gives you the flexibility to get the job done. I don't know how many drivers out there that think that once you hit the 14, you got to stop. Well, you do. You can't drive on a highway, but you can continue to work. So that's the 14-hour rule that's interesting. Now, the 11-hour rule, can you drive more than 11 hours? A lot of drivers say, nope. Not true. They have adverse and emergency conditions. Adverse and emergency conditions. You can drive two hours over the 11 under adverse conditions. I'm going to explain that in a second. So if at time of dispatch you did not know about certain conditions, you can drive up to 13 hours as long as you would have made it otherwise. So if I'm tooling back and, and I'm coming back to my company terminal and I'm going to make it in plenty of time, but there's a huge accident that was unanticipated on the road and it delays you an hour and a half. Now you're not going to get back until 12 and a half hours. If you document, document, document in your log, type adverse conditions, unknown time of dispatch, emergency road conditions due to a huge crash, right? You can exceed that up to 13 hours. Now, can you exceed the 14 under adverse? No. However, the rumor on the street, and I'm going to keep saying this, new rules are coming out soon. The rumor on the street is that they're going to allow up to two hours of extra time towards your 14 under adverse conditions. That's not the case yet, but that's what's on the horizon. Literally, instead of the 11 to the 13 being the only option, you can do the 14 to the 16. I have to say this again. 
This is not an effect now. Now, everybody on the call, what we want to do at our companies is if you think adverse applies, we're educating you on the rule. Do not use it unless you get approval. We want to do this because we don't want guys going crazy using this thing when they don't truly understand it. But once we get an idea and we get repetition and people start using it in a proper manner, then we're going to open it up to a higher level. But you see how that could help you get the job done which helps with recruiting and retention as well. Hey, we promote these kind of things. The government has given us the opportunity, so let's do it. So this is the definition of adverse. It says um, you may drive up to two hours in the maximum time for the Highway 11, but it says that you can't have known this at time of dispatch. The, the, the words are none of which were apparent on the basis of information known to the person dispatching the run. So. Can you use adverse in snow, sleet, fog, or weather conditions? Anything that's unusual or road or traffic conditions or emergency situations? Yes. But it had to have been unknown at time of dispatch. Hey, there's a blizzard tomorrow. You can't use it then. Um, but heavy fog, that a lot of times is unknown at time of dispatch. So now, the 70-hour rule. Can you work over the 70-hour rule? Yeah. So you owner-operators. Let's say you work Monday through Friday, 14 hour days, and you hit 70 on Friday. Can you go to your shop and turn a wrench and work on your truck all morning Saturday as long as you don't drive it on a highway? Yes. So let's say you put six hours working on your truck, fixing all those maintenance things that we got over the course of the week, right, that you discovered. So now you're at 76 hours. Now, if you take the rest of Saturday off all day Sunday, on Monday, you'll have a restart and you'll start at zero. So did you drive your truck after the 70? No. Did you work? Yes, but you didn't drive on a highway, so you're okay. Um, here's another fallacy. Do you have to have a restart? No. A lot of drivers think that the restart came and you have to have it. Think of it this way from chasing your hours with a recap. If you work eight hours a day, eight days a week, at the end of the eight days, right, eight hours a day, eight days, you're at 64 hours. That's not over the 70. So can you work eight hours a day, 365 days a year without ever taking a day off? Now, I'm not saying that's a good idea, but you can absolutely do it without a restart. So now the 30-minute break. Um, if you start at 6 a.m., at 2 p.m., you should have had a 30-minute break. That's true, except if you start at 6 a.m. and you get to a shipper at 2 p.m. and the dock doors are empty, and you can go over there and unload. You can push yard move at the shipper as long as it's not a highway push yard move, work for an hour and a half loading and unloading and, and dropping and hooking, what do you need to do before you leave that facility? You need to take a 30 minute break. If you take a 30 minute break before you leave the facility, then when you jump on a highway, you got your 30 minute break. So if you start at 6 a.m. at 2 p.m., you cannot drive on a highway until a 30 minute break. But if you start at 6 a.m. and it's 2 p.m., can you work? Yes. Most efficient way would be yard move at a shipper working and then you take your 30 minute break kind of get a jump start on pc which goes along with that violation we had let's say you start at 6 a.m and it's 2 p.m then you do yard move for two hours now you're at 10 hours and now you need a 30 minute break and you're loaded and the shipper says leave my property can you pc to a nearby reasonable safe truck stop as long as it's the closest one during your 30 minute break yes that officer potentially was wrong you can use PC during your 30 minute break. So if it only took 10 minutes to drive to that truck stop, then you technically could stay at the truck stop 20 minutes and that's your 30 minute break. Now we don't recommend that. We would rather have you use PC for the 10, then take an additional 30 to get adequate rest. It's good for legal practices when we, so we don't get sued, you see? But technically if you start at 6 a.m. at 2 p.m., use yard move for two hours, then go off duty PC for 10 minutes to a truck stop, and stay at the truck stop 20 minutes, that's your 30 minute break, you can go. A lot of guys don't understand this. So what are we trying to do? Knowledge is power. Part of this seminar, the little meeting that we're having is to do stuff safely, but we wanna do it compliantly, but we also wanna do it efficiently. If we can make as much money as possible, do it safely and compliant, that's our goal. We don't wanna hurt anybody, but we wanna make the money and we wanna have flexibility and that's what we're trying to do. So the 30 minute break, rumor on the street, I keep saying this, rumor on the street, uh, which we will know shortly, is the 30 minute break is likely to disappear. 
I'm not saying it's disappearing, but keep your ear to the ground. It is possible this is going away. And again, rumor on the street says that's likely the case. Um, new rules on the horizon. Now, on duty time, we won't go crazy, but there are four duty statuses. And with paper logs, we know them. With ELDs, we know them. What are the duty statuses? Everybody's mind should be going. Off duty is one. Sleep or birth is another. Driving is another. And on duty is another. Of those four duty statuses, one of them in that green book has no definition. Which one is not defined in the green book? Well, I'll tell you, sleeper birth in 393.76 is clearly defined. It tells you exactly the diameters of what a sleeper birth is. Driving is defined because it means you're at the controls of the vehicle operating the vehicle. On duty is the definition you see in front of you. So if you define sleeper and you define driving and you define on duty, by default, everything else is what? Off duty. So don't look for a definition of off duty. Learn what driving is, learn what sleeper birth is, and learn what on duty is, and everything else is off duty. Now I'd say driving's simple. You're driving on a highway. Unless you're PC or yard move, you're driving, period. Sleeper birth, am I physically sitting in a sleeper birth? If you are, then it's sleeper birth. Now on duty is a little trickier, but a lot of people don't get this. Just because I'm at a plant or facility or other property or a shipper does not mean I'm on duty. I am on duty if I'm at those locations unless I have been relieved from duty by my company. So the motor carrier can release me from duty while at a shipper. If I back to the dock and give them paperwork, I'm on duty. Now I go sit in my parked truck while they're loading and unloading me. That's all off duty the whole time. That's my 30 minute break. That's my two hour break to use for split sleeper, et cetera. So just because I'm at a shipper doesn't mean I'm on duty because this definition says if I'm relieved from duty by my trucking company, I'm not. Now, if you're inspecting, servicing, or working on a vehicle, that's on duty. Driving time is clearly on duty because it's defined as driving time. Time spent resting in a parked vehicle. It says if you're in the vehicle, in the CMV, that's on duty unless you're resting and you've been relieved from work. So can you sit inside your truck and be off duty at a shipper? Yes. However, if you're loading and unloading and you're supervising and assisting in that loading and unloading, attending the vehicle, remaining in readiness, watching them do activities, giving or receiving paperwork and receipts, that's all on duty. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, <laughs> meaning on duty. All right, repairing a vehicle, breast sample for drug, performing work for anything other than the motor carrier, or having second jobs. So that's on duty. Now, personal conveyance, it's a good lead in. This is the guidance that came out in June of 2018. Personal conveyance came out in June of 2018. Prior to June of 18, it had a different definition. Whatever you remember from the old school PC, forget it. I'm gonna teach you new school PC, which is today, PC personal conveyance. It says, a driver may record PC, which is off duty, which, sorry officer, can be part of our 30 minute break as long as we follow this guidance that I'm reading to you, right? As long as you're relieved from work and all responsibility of performing work by the motor carrier. Well, we just went through the definition of on duty. If you are relieved from work and you're not performing work by your company, you can use PC. Walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck. And I'll tell you, if you're trying to convince yourself that it's not work, then guess what? It's probably work. So what's the next piece? It says laden. Um, the vehicle can be laden. Whether you have a load or you don't have a load has no bearing on whether or not you can use PC. So I don't care if you have freight or not. The question is, when you're moving with that freight, is it considered work? So then the last piece is motor carriers, meaning us, can establish limitations, i.e. a personal conveyance policy. We could say, if you're relieved from work, loaded or not, you can use it, but you can't go over X amount of miles or X amount of distance. So we can impose limitations. Just because what I'm about to read to you says it's okay doesn't mean it is for us. It means it is legally, but might not be for us. 
So now this document, which we can send this document out to everybody, I recommend everybody print it and put it in your truck and highlight the things that apply to you. It says appropriate uses, appropriate uses. So examples of appropriate uses. If you are at a motel or truck stop, you can use PC to drive on a highway off duty if you're going to a restaurant or entertainment. I don't like this. If it were my company, which we don't have a policy yet, but we're going to put one into place, I would discourage once you're at a truck stop and you found yourself some parking, do you really want to go to an Applebee's that isn't designed for truck parking and try to squeeze in there with no place to park and then we bump into some cars? Instead of that, how about you leave your truck at the truck stop and Uber <laughs> to the Applebee's or get Uber Eats, right? Or plan ahead, get a subway, do something. But I would say it's not a great activity to be at a motel or truck stop during your break and try to do that. However, is it legal? Yeah. So if you want to do this and you feel that the circumstances persist, then communicate, communicate, communicate. So now here's one that guys under the guys and gals that drive truck are misunderstanding across the board. And I don't, I'm just the bearer of the information. Don't be yelling at the messenger, right? It says clearly in here that if you're at a company terminal, you can go to your residence. If you're at a company drop lot or a drop lot, you can go to your residence. Ooh, it does say work site. You can go to your residence. Eh. The government said, nope, work site is for construction companies that do work on the site. They have explicitly said that work site is not a shipper receiver where you load and unload. So take work site off the table for us. Now we have to go from terminal to residence. That's okay. Drop lot to residence. That's okay. When else can you go to your residence? Under personal conveyance, you can't. The only time you can go to and from your house is if you're going from a terminal to your residence and back or a drop lot to your residence and back. After you load and unload, that's number three. Number three says after loading and unloading, you can go to a nearby reasonable safe. I don't want anybody using the word safe haven, right? Here's the three words you should remember. Nearby, reasonable, safe. Why? Because that's what it says in this document, right? So it has to be the first such location reasonably available. So if I am at a shipper, if I start at 6 a.m. and at 8 p.m. I get to a shipper, then I do yard move for, say, three hours. Then they say, get out of here. You can't stay here. I can push PC and where can I go? I can go in any direction, even if it's advancing to the next shipper. I can go in any direction as long as I'm going to the first nearby reasonable safe location. So after you load and unload, you can go to the first nearby reasonable safe. Now let's say I get there and the truck stops full. Then it's not reasonable. So I should take photographic evidence and videos to prove, because my ELD will show I went there, the photos or the video will show I went there. Then I proceed from that first location and I go to the next first location that is nearby reasonable safe. Is it possible that that's in the opposite direction of my delivery? Sure. Then that's where you got to go. You can go any direction as long as that direction that you go is the nearby reasonable safe location. Now, does this say that after loading and unloading, I can go to my residence? Nope. Does it say after loading and unloading, I can go to my terminal? Nope. It says I can go to the closest place. If you are parked and you're like, whew, finally found it. Good day and a safety official says you can't park here, leave. You can use PC to go find a place. So that's good. And then the rest of this is motor coach, motor coach. Now the next part of this document says you do not qualify. If you're enhancing operational readiness, uh, sounds like work. After you just delivered a towed unit, you're bobtailing to go pick up another towed unit. Uh, sounds like work. You're bobtailing with an empty trailer in order to go get a load. Uh, work. So if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. If you're doing maintenance, if you're placed out of service at roadside, the officer will let you use PC to go find a place. And but the last one here is number seven, important. You cannot travel to a terminal after loading and unloading. It says would not qualify to travel to the company terminal after loading and unloading. And on the previous page, after loading and unloading, you can't go to your house either. 
You can only go to a nearby reasonable safe location to get rest. It has to be that first location. Now, again, going back to that roadside with those 30 minute breaks, he used words like enhanced operational readiness, advancing the load. Well, advancing the load isn't even in this document I just told you. And nowhere in here does it say that you have to be within your hours to use PC. It's off duty. Um, so we're going to question that one from May. And I'll tell you, if we can challenge that, that one month we were in an alert for national heavy hall is going to go away because it wasn't our fault in the first place. But could we be more educated when we get pulled over? I'd say yes. Ill or fatigue. Now, all this talk of PC and driving off duty, please don't do it if you're tired. Because there's a separate part of the regulation, 392, that says you can't operate ill or fatigued. Yard moves. Now, we've been talking yard moves. There are three times where you can drive your truck, and there are three different duty status for driving your truck. Now, that might seem weird. I can drive my truck in three different duty statuses? Yes. You can drive your truck in PC as off-duty, which we just talked about. You can certainly drive your truck in the driving line, which we've been doing for decades. But you can also drive your truck in the on-duty, not driving duty status, as long as you are not on a highway. So now the definition of a highway. Let's take a truck stop. Is a truck stop parking lot a road or a street? No. Is it a way? Yes. Is that truck stop parking lot passable by a four-wheel car? Yes. Is the truck stop parking lot on private property? Yes. Is the truck stop parking lot open to the public? Yes, because there's no gates or signs saying no public access. So a truck stop parking lot is a highway and you cannot use yard move. Now, at a shipper, is it a road or street? No. Is it a way? Yes. Is it on private property? Yes. Is it passable by a car? Yes. Aha. But is it open to the public? If it has any kind of signs or gates restricting access to the public, then it is no longer a highway, and you can use this as yard move, which means you can drive. Now, some of you have terminals. I highly recommend you put signage up prohibiting public access at our terminals. So when you hit our terminal at the 14th hour, and it's the end of the week, and you want to drop and hook, maybe fuel up, whatever you want to do, you can actually drop down to on duty, not driving under yard move, drive around your lot, dropping and hooking loads at your terminal, as long as it's not a highway, and then you can go home and get your restart over the weekend. So these are ways that you can use these hours of service to your advantage. If confused, don't do it. Be old school guy, 11, 30 minute break, 10 hour break, 11, 30 minute break, 14 hour day, 10 hour break, and just do that monotonously right? But if we can use this to our advantage, why not? Now, prior to ELDs, did we need to know all these exemptions? No. Now that we have ELDs, we have to, because before we just lied, <laughs> right? But you can't do that anymore. So now the short haul exemption, 100 air mile radius. If you are primarily a short haul driver, meaning you do not need a log more than eight days in a 30 day period, you're exempt from an ELD. So there are five questions to ask. Let's say you're a driver, you stay within 100 air miles, which is 115 statute miles. You leave and return to go home within 12 hours. Remember this 12 hour thing. So you have to leave and return to the same spot and go home within 12 hours to qualify for this 100 air mile. Stay within the mileage, go home within 12 hours, leave and return. Take 10 hours off, don't drive more than 11, and have time cards showing time start, time finish, total hours. If you meet these five questions, you don't need a logbook today. And if you do that the majority of the time, meaning you only need a logbook seven, eight or less times a month. So let's say I'm driving, I'm always local and I make one trip over the road for three days. Well, then I can run paper for three days because I'm local the rest. Now that's the 100 air mile radius driver. What's interesting is they're considering changing this to a 14 hour day instead of this 12 hour day. So now instead of leaving and returning within 12, they're proposing leaving and returning within 14. And then rumor on the street again, rumor on the street, is they're going to change this 100 air mile to 150. So they may be getting rid of the 100 into 150, but that's not the case and that's rumor. They were supposed to publish these on June 7th, which is four days ago, but they delayed it. They said that they think they're going to come out sometime this month. So keep your ear to the ground. Now, split sleeper. We're not going to spend a lot of time because we only have an hour and a half. I think we're going to do a webinar on split sleeper down the road for those that are interested. I'm going to quickly explain it to you. And after I explain this, some who already know it 
or may learn it, they can actually plan their day using it. Someone else could use your ELD to calculate the hours for you and others, you're gonna be like, I don't get this, it's too complicated, right? So let's say here, I took a 10 hour break. I do a pre-trip and I drive for about four hours. Then I take a two hour break at a shipper because I'm in a parked vehicle for two hours and they're unloading me, right? Then I drive for a little bit. Let's pretend this isn't one hour. Let's pretend it's more like six. I'm doing this so it fits on a log. So 10 hour break, four hours of driving, two hours off, six hours of driving, that would be about 10 driving, 11, 12, I'm done, right? Now I do eight consecutive in the sleeper. I can take this eight hours and add it to this two, and this is my 10 hour break. Now when I start counting again, I'm gonna start counting right here at the end of the two hour period, because it's the first of the two periods for my 10 hour break. So where do I start counting? Right here. This will be one, uh, six hours, because I said this was six. Eight hours in the sleeper does not count towards my 14. It extends my 14. So at the end of here, I only have this driving, which we had said was six hours, not one, using your imagination. So let's start over. 10 hour break, pre-trip, drive for four, take two off, drive for six, take eight off, take this eight, add it to two, start counting here. Six hours, this doesn't count, I can drive for five more. And how many do I need over here? Two, I can take this two and add it to that eight. Boom. Now, how many drivers use this? Not a lot. Why? Because we had paper. Why? Because you just lie. Now that we can't lie, let's use this. Why do we want to use it? What's on the horizon? Split sleeper in multiples greater than eight and two. So if you get delayed at a shipper for four hours, then you finish your day, you can actually take that four, add it to six, and boogie on down the road. Is that coming? Yes. Is it on the horizon? Yes. Is it effective today? No. But what we're trying to do is go back to that safety management cycle. We're going to have policies about using split. We're going to make sure you understand your role. We're going to hire good guys and understand how to do it. And we're going to train you. Then we're going to monitor you. If you get it, great. If you kind of get it, let the ELD calculate it for you. And those that just don't get it and abuse it will just take it away from you, but not everybody. It's not fair to take it away from everybody when it adds flexibility to our lives. So supporting documents. We need to make sure that we're turning all documents in within 13 days or that's a critical violation. Get your paperwork in. What is our plan for ELD? Little history lesson, the rule came out in December of 17. We installed devices prior to December of 17, so we are AOBRDs. Come December of 19, we have to convert to ELDs. There are specific things we need to be aware of that is on the horizon right around the corner. What are some of those things? These are those things. I'm going to go right into it. Visibility at roadside. You have to show the officer the display of your device in the truck if he comes up to the truck and wants to show it to you. That's no different than the AOBRDs. So when you have ELDs, it's going to be about the same. You just show them your device. This next slide is where there's some big differences. When the officer comes up with an ELD, he can say, I don't want to see your device. I want you to email or over the web, send me a file of data so I can pull it off the internet and upload it to my laptop in the squad car behind your truck. He will never look at your log. He's going to say, send me a file. When he sends the file, he's going to upload it into a system that looks just like this called ERODS. Whether you have a Samsara, an Omnitrax, an XRS, a keeping truck, and it does not matter. All your logs are going to look the same in the eyes of the officer, which is this screen. So now, what is your responsibility? You have to learn how to transfer the file to him. And it's not just faxing or a PDF. This is a legitimate transfer option. So once ELDs come into effect, he's going to say, hey, transfer your data file. Well, I don't know how. Violation for fair to transfer the data file. Well, that sucks because that wasn't a violation up till now. Now, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, and I'm really sorry, but driving time triggers at five miles an hour. If you hit five miles an hour, it's going to put you in the driving line. Now, does that mean legally? Legally, it's okay to drive three miles an hour around the parking lot at a shipper? No, because it's still a duck. <laughs> right, driving around, loading and unloading. I already told you what on duty was. You cannot load and unload and supervise that. You can't drop and hook. So just driving under five miles an hour to keep yourself off duty and perform work activity is still a violation. 
I don't know why the government put five miles an hour as the threshold, but they did. So what I'm saying is don't drive under five miles an hour to get away with it. What you should do is driving is driving, driving under PC is off duty, and driving under yard move is on duty. Those are your three options legally. All right, so ELD malfunctions. If your device malfunctions, you have to fill out a paper log for the period of malfunction under the ELD. You have to possess the logs for the last seven days, or if you can still see them in your device, you're good. Here's a big kicker. They have to be repaired in eight days. If your device malfunctions, you have to report that malfunction to management. They have to act on it, and within eight days, they have to fix it, or you can't use that truck unless you get an extension from FMCSA by sending a letter to the division office in your state of domicile. Oh, man, get this. This is stupid. You have an instruction card for Omnitrax telling you how to operate the vehicle, right? That's as an example. You also need eight blank set of logs. I get this one. But the ELD mandate has a different instruction card. It's called an ELD instruction card. And it's broken down into three parts. How to transfer that data file, what to do if it malfunctions, and how to use the device. Under an AOBRD, we just have a card that says how to use the device. So it's one point in CSA for not having a card under the AOBRD. One times three is three, and one times two is two, and one times one is one, and then after two years, not having the card falls off our system. Under the ELD, it's three points, because there's three parts. So it's gonna be three times three is nine, three times two is six, three times one is three. So it is three times as important to make sure you have the proper instruction card under an ELD than you did an AOBRD. And don't have the wrong one. We need to shred every AOBRD one when we switch to the ELD and not mistakenly use them. Because I could see us filling up violations across the board because we're using old instruction cards. All right, the header. Please enter in your bill lading number and your trailer ID. Everything else should pre-populate via programming, but not your bill lading and not your trailer. And certify your logs. Get this. Right now, if you forget to certify a log, um, no violation under AOBRD. ELD, he pulls you over and you didn't certify yesterday. When he pulled you over today, you get written up for that and get CSA points. So certify your log every day. So that's hours of service. I told you we were going to be on this for an hour and 30 minutes at the most, and we're right on pace. We're done with hours of service and CSA and, and all that. But now we're talking maintenance. I want you to refocus. We're going to refocus right back to safety again. We've talked money. we talked expenses. we talked flexibility. We talked about getting the job done, following the hours of service. I, be it, don't operate ill or fatigued. But this girl right here, 10 days before her due date, a wheel fell from her truck, smashed through her window, window, and she and her unborn baby died. So she lost her life because of maintenance. Cullen's funeral. And now it says David Cullen lost three daughters, an 8-year-old, a 5-year-old, and a 15-month-old. With any luck, this 8-year-old will have one memory of her mother, maybe two. Maybe seeing her hair blow in the wind, or you know, maybe they went to the zoo once and she just focus on that one memory. But I'll tell you, unfortunately, I doubt the five-year-old or the 15-month-old will have any memory. Why? Because of maintenance. We owe it to the people that we operate to operate our company in a safe manner. And we don't want to be the ones to hurt anybody, whether it's your Katie or my Katie. Remember, we got to focus on safety. So now finding defects is a team effort. Let's say that our tire has less than 50% of the pressure marked on the sidewall. That tire is flat and it's out of service. Who could find that tire that's low on air? Uh, drivers, that's one, that's probably the best. Who else? Any mechanics that do PM should be checking our tires. Who else? Well, the state patrol can for sure. Now we're challenged from a headquarters standpoint, but we're not challenged from an agent standpoint. So agents are supervisors. You have a responsibility to make sure that those people under you as an agent are reporting defects because they're your drivers as well as ours. <clears throat> Wherever you're taking your vehicles, they're your mechanics as well as ours. So you need to get out there and spot check your trucks too. It's not all the responsibility of the driver or the mechanic. Agents, I'm not just going to point fingers at drivers. It's your responsibility to take a proactive approach to your own program and fix these things too. 
Now, I told you, a, a flat tire is eight points. Out of service is two. Times, that's 10. Times three is 30, then 20, then 10, then two years it disappears. If you, an agent, go out and find an underinflated tire that is, that is flat, how many points is that? It's zero. Zero because we took a proactive approach and we found it before anybody else did. So that's fantastic. And that's all we're trying to do here. We're just trying to take a proactive approach. Because I tell you, if these three do a better job, the State Patrol, you don't have to worry about. Now, how do your tires look? Well, they're Jeff Gordon tires. And I said it. I said Jeff Gordon because I'm a Jeff Gordon fan. I used to watch NASCAR forever, and I don't watch it no more because he announces. I don't want to listen to him. I just wanted to watch him drive. Right? So these are major tread grooves, steer tires, 430 seconds, drive tires, 230 seconds. Even a flat spot, less than 230 seconds on a drive tire is a major tread groove, less than 230 seconds is an eight point violation. It might not meet the out of service threshold, but so be it. Um, these are tires that I saw at a medallion. No, I didn't see it at a medallion. I'm just kidding. I saw it somewhere else. All right. So now what is this? This is a picture of a truck. See, you guys thought it was going to be all technical. It's, and it's not paint by numbers, right? Every number on here is a required element on a truck. So look on the back of this truck. White tape, 12 inches long on the back of this truck. Can this be red and white? Nope. How many inches does it have to be? 12 inches white in color. If you got the plastic ones that are stuck on and they fall off, how about you go out to all your trucks right now and put paint and stick uh, put tape on them right next to the plastic one so when they fall off we already have a piece of tape there that's proactive every truck needs a mud flap I don't care if you have a trailer or not you have to have mud flaps and then you need red and white tape on the mud flaps red and white tape on the mud flaps these are all required lights little trivia let's say you had a bunch of lights on the bottom here is there a number attached to that nope is that an auxiliary light yes is that required no Auxiliary lights are not required. Only required lights are required under the feds. Now, some states are different. California, for example, says if the light's there, it's got to work. But that's not a fed violation. That won't hurt our CSA scores like any of these things missing will. So now, we're going to do van trailer, but flatbed's the same. Red and white tape half the length of the trailer spaced evenly. ICC bumper, red and white. Bottom of the doors, red and white. In the corners, white tape, 12 inches, 12 inches, 12 inches, 12 inches. All these lights and tape are required. Now, I don't even like calling them tape. I like calling them stickers, right? Because stickers is so, like, you know, it's like having a dumb violation. Like, we're really missing stickers, right? Now, interesting about this is I have an 18, 16, 14-year-old. We drive around, and I sell insurance, and I'm a consultant. We drive around, and my son, he's 16, he'll see a truck with the wrong stickers on the truck or the trailer. And he'll drive by, and he'll say, Dad, that one didn't have stickers. I said, did you get the picture? He goes, yeah, I got the picture. I said, take a picture of their DOT number. So he takes a picture of the side of your door with the stickers wrong on the truck. Then he looks you up in the system and finds out how many trucks you have. He's like, Dad, they got 50 trucks. I'm like, 50 trucks? That's good, Evan. Send me a text. He's like, I'll send you the phone number right now. His name is Jimmy. So then he sends me the phone number. I call Jimmy, tell him I just saw his truck on the road and I have pictures. Then my son sends him an email from my email account with the pictures on it. And then I write their insurance. <laughs> right? I'm just kidding. But this is what's required. So now push rod travel. Air disc, air disc, air disc. Get air disc and they can't inspect it. But if we have push rod travel, what's the maximum push rod travel on a steer axle? I'm going to tell you, almost all steers in the United States for tractors, semi-tractors, an inch and three quarters. This push rod can come out of this chamber no more than an inch and three quarters. Live by that and you're good. How far can the push rod come out of drive and trailer brakes? Two inches. An inch and three quarters on the steer, two inches everywhere else. Now, some of you that are mechanically inclined, there's things called long strokes. A long stroke gives you extra push rod travel. If you have a long stroke on a steer, it would be two inches. A long stroke on a driver trailer, it's two and a half inches. But if you just live by an inch and three quarters and two inches on drives and trailers, I don't care if you have a long stroke or not, you're good. Now let's say they try to write you up for two inches on a steer, but you know you have long strokes. Well, now you can point that out to the inspector. How do you know if you have long strokes? When the hose comes into the chamber, if it's a circle port that the hose connects to, it's regular. If it's a square port, it's a long stroke. 
So that's the best way to determine that. Now, when you're in your truck, it's snowing, it's raining, it's cold, you don't want to be outside. Well, good. Click your key on and make sure this ABS light cycles on and cycles off. If you click your key on and that light never turns on, it's a violation. If you click your key and it cycles on, doesn't turn off, it's a violation. What should happen on your trailer? It should turn on and off, just like the light in the dash. I'll tell you, pretend you're driving down the road and an ABS light is stuck in the on position on your trailer in the, in the dark. Isn't that an invitation to get pulled over? What's interesting is our hours of service are slightly in an alert because of the last inspection per se and the other ones, right? Do you think we got pulled over because we had an hours of service violation? No, we got pulled over for something else, whether it was random or whatever. And I'll tell you, if you're driving down the road with a lit up ABS light, heck, at least cut the wire. No, I'm just as a joke. Don't be cutting the wire. I'm just kidding. No, fix it. Fix it. That was a joke. Nobody go cutting wires, right? Put black tape on it. No, 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 don't do that either. I'm kidding. It's a joke. All right. So now, brake warning light buzzer. Buttons in, push the brakes, release, brakes, release. Your pressure gets around 52, 55. This brake light will come on, air warning light, and your buzzer will come on. Interesting is the light's required, the buzzer's actually not. The buzzer is auxiliary, it's extra. So if they try to say, oh, your light works, but your buzzer doesn't, uh, dude, it ain't a violation. But let's say your light didn't work, but the buzzer did. It would keep you from being placed out of service. So the buzzer can keep you from being out of service. How would you know that? You got to read that yellow book I told you earlier because it says if you have a brake warning light, it's a violation. If the light doesn't work but the buzzer does, we're not going to place you out of service. So should both work? Yeah. Air loss rate test. Engine on, buttons in, push the buttons in, release the brakes, hit the brake pedal and hold it. You will see your air gauge fall slightly because the whole thing's filled up with air. The brake system filled up with air. It should stop, maintain pressure, or increase. Then you didn't fail your air loss rate test. If it keeps falling with the engine running and your button's pushed in, you have a leak somewhere where the compressor can't keep up with the leak and you're losing air faster than it's building it up. You know when your tandems get locked up on the road, that's what this is attributed to. So you should do this test. Now, one last test before you leave. Every time you hook up a trailer, I'll say it again, Every time you hook up a trailer, you should roll the window down, turn the engine off, hit the brake pedal, and hold it. What are you listening for? Air leaks at the glad hands. I say every time you pick up a trailer is because you're connecting the airlines. If they're going to leak somewhere, even a small leak, a lot of times it's that rubber grommet that costs 10 cents. Do I want our CSA score to go up so the insurance underwriter charges us $500 more per truck when we have 100 trucks, and then they charge us $50,000 for four grommets that didn't work on a glad hand? No. I want as many things fixed as possible. We have to be proactive. Inspection report. If you have a copy of the inspection report, you don't need a decal on truck and trailer. If you have a decal, you don't need the inspection report. It's great practice to have both. If your de decal is worn out and the inspector says, how come your decal is worn out? I can't read it. Violation. Uh, dude, I have the inspection report. Oh, you're good. Right? So you need one or the other. That operational policy, remember that with the chafing? They have a new one for called oil and grease leaks. Get this. It now says a violation should not be written unless seepage or a leak is great enough to form a drop and drip during the inspection. So just because you have an engine block saturated with oil, if it doesn't drip during the inspection, you're good. So we're going to issue shop rags to every driver. When it drips in the parking lot, you're going to say to the inspector, hey, look over there, and you wipe it up real quick. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, we're going to issue booties, like those hospital booties, so you can wipe up. Those. No, we're not going to have oil leaks. That's the point of what I'm saying. I'm kidding. So finding defects is a team effort. If we are proactive and kick ass with brakes, lights, tires. Oops, I just said ass on a recording. I'm sorry about that. Um, driver, mechanic, supervisor, if they really kick butt, State Patrol won't find any violations. We won't get pulled over and nothing else will be a problem. Now, before we go one step further, what can get you pulled over? Unsafe driving can get you pulled over. If he sees you don't have your seatbelt on, he sees you're following too close, he catches you speeding, you're in the wrong lane, you're on your cell phone, all those things can get you pulled over. What else can get you pulled over? Lights, especially at night. So drive safely, fix all your lights, what else is going to get you pulled over? Not much. Maybe a cracked windshield. All the other violations are generally found after you get pulled over. Do not give them a reason to pull you over. 
if you were drunk and you had suspended plates, would you drive by a police station? <laughs> right? No. You know, if you're drunk, at least get some plates that aren't expired. No, I'm just kidding. Don't drink. Get good plates. Then you don't have to worry about driving by a police station. See, I'm just kidding. All right. So now unsafe driving. You can have whatever you want in the top six inches of this windshield. The only thing you can put opposite of the top six inches is safety technology or a GPS unit. When the wiper comes up to this point, measure four inches down, you can have a camera or a, you know, a GPS unit. When the wiper's down here and rolls up at the bottom base of the wiper, measure up seven inches. You can put a GPS unit or a camera over here. You can't have everything in your, in your view of sight, nothing below six inches unless it's safety technology. And that just came out. Here's a couple slides in case you want to see these later that outline all the verbiage of what I just said. Texting while driving. You cannot talk on a phone with it in your hand. You cannot text on a phone with it in your hand. Best bet, don't have your phone in your hand. Anita just told me recently one of our drivers pulled his phone out of his pocket to send it, set it next to him. And they saw him grab his phone out of his pocket and send it next to him. The only problem is he wasn't texting. And he wasn't using a handheld mobile telephone to conduct a voice communication. Pulling a phone out of your pocket and setting it next to you, he did not text or talk. But the officer saw him. So now we have to somehow data cue that. And that's kind of word against word, right? Uh, maybe we can get phone records and text messages. Wouldn't it have been best if he just didn't touch it? Just don't touch it. PSP. The PSP is called the Pre-Employment Screening Program. Everybody knows what their MBR is, their driver abstract. The PSP is the Pre-Employment Screening Program. Good companies in the United States use the PSP to vet drivers to decide whether to hire them or not. Now, why am I telling you about the PSP is one of the last slides of this presentation? Because we have a DOT number and only drivers and the way we operate with our culture can hurt our scores, our CSA. Only drivers and how we operate as a safety culture can hurt our scores. Now, can you have a driver that gets hired on Monday, speeds on Tuesday, quits on Wednesday? Yep. And how long do we have to live with that bad violation? For two years, and he only worked for us for four hours, right? Now, what do I want that driver to know? He obviously didn't care about us. And out of all the drivers we have, I'm going to be honest, not all of you care about us, right? But you care about yourself. So do you want your PSP messed up? No, you want a clean PSP to go to that next employer and the next employer and the next employer. Now, do I want you to leave us? No, I'm not promoting losing drivers and having high turnover, but I'll tell you what, it's trucking. We have turnover, nothing's gonna change that. We don't want you in our seat today, screw up our score and leave tomorrow. Be advised, it hurts you too. Now, am I doing this because I care about you? No, I care about the company. And I'm trying to trick you into caring about us by default, by caring about yourself. No, I'm just kidding. I care about everybody. I'm that kind of fellow. Safety culture. So now, um, reflective tape. Do we have a policy and procedure saying that the back of every truck should have 12 inch white reflective tape in the corners? And if you have a plastic one, you should put tape next to it? Yep. Should you have two mud flaps on your semi tractor? Yep. Should you have red and white tape on it? Yep. Should you have red and white tape on the sides and on the back of the doors and on the ICC bumper and in the corners, white tape in the corners? Yep. Should you put red and white tape in the corners? Nope. So that's our policy. Does everybody understand the role? Yeah, make sure you have the stickers on your truck. Um, management's role, make sure your drivers have the stickers on their truck. Qualification hiring. Do we have drivers and agents and mechanics that know how to put stickers on trucks? Training communication. Does everybody understand that we can get pulled over for not having stickers on our trucks? Monitoring and tracking. Everybody look at all of our trucks and trailers and make sure we have stickers on them. Mon meaningful action, new policy. Anybody that gets a violation for not having a sticker on your truck, you're terminated. No, I'm just kidding, you're not terminated. Um, but we're gonna take corrective action and we're just gonna give you a piece of paper. No, I'm just kidding, that's not even funny either. All right, so um, I said we'd be done in about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half. It has been an hour and 15 minutes, so I feel stellar. I'm now gonna drop down this little thing here I'm gonna stop the recording because we don't wanna record our question and answers because for liability purposes, we don't wanna demonstrate that maybe we didn't know an answer. Huh? So that's good. So all you attorneys out there listening, sorry, dude.